Oh, this is Marcos Patchett, the nocturnal herbalist, and this is the sixth video in my series on social isolation. And in this video, I'm going to be talking about medicinal plants that can be used to prevent or alleviate some of the physical and mental health problems that can arise from social isolation or loneliness over the long term. So as I discussed in a previous video, there are several mechanisms by which social isolation and loneliness can cause health problems, both physical and mental. So any remedies that are prescribed or used need to address those issues, ideally. So I've divided them into three categories. The first category is disease susceptibility or morbidity. The second category is mechanisms by which disease is, is produced. And the third category is psychological or mental health issues. So the first set of things that need to be addressed are disease susceptibility or morbidity factors. And that includes any remedy needs to be able to reduce the risk of death from all causes, which is a pretty broad remit, but uh, social isolation increases that risk, should be able to specifically reduce the risk of death from heart disease or stroke, cardiovascular diseases in general, should also reduce susceptibility to viruses or cancers. In other words, put another way, it should increase Th1 immunity, the division of the immune system that helps to identify and attack cells that are infected with viruses or cells that have mutated and become cancerous. And that, so that's the first category. The second category is mechanisms. Ideally, any remedies should do the following. They should reduce systemic inflammation, reduce oxidative stress, in other words, have antioxidant properties, should reduce tonic vascular resistance, in other words, should be able to dilate the blood vessels and improve circulation. They should be able to increase the cellular immune response, and that kind of overlaps with the one from the previous category about the increased risk of cancers and viruses. And finally, and possibly most importantly, they should be able to reduce glucocorticoid resistance or cortisol resistance. They should ideally lower cortisol and lower adrenaline or modulate the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the control of the adrenal output. So essentially be able to control cortisol and stress steroid and reduce long-term negative effects of stress. The third category which is the mental health category. Any remedies for social isolation should reduce subjective feelings of loneliness and low mood, should reduce anxiety, should reduce fear responses, and should also help to improve sleep. Now, there are actually quite a lot of medicinal plants, I would say thousands, that can do various things in those categories. So I not entirely arbitrarily picked three. I picked one because I've spent the last 14 years researching and writing a book about it, that is chocolate. When I was researching this topic, I discovered um, to my surprise and delight that in fact, a lot of the issues induced by social isolation in terms of physical and mental health are partly addressed, believe it or not, by cacao, by chocolate. Now I'm going to do a whole massive presentation on this called Chocolate and Social Isolation. It's an hour-long talk that I'll be delivering for this year's annual general meeting of the National Institute of Medical Herbalists, of which I am a member. Obviously that's all online. Once that has been done, I will upload that presentation to my YouTube channel. So I'm not going to go too into detail on, on cacao, Theobroma cacao or chocolate in this video. The other two remedies that I want to highlight in this video are lemon balm or Melissa officinalis and oats or Avena sativa. The first thing I'm going to do is whack on the screen a little table or a set of three tables addressing each of those three broad categories. So the first category, the disease susceptibility category, the second category, which is the mechanisms by which disease is called, caused, and the third category, which is the mental health category. So the first category, lemon balm, my second herb, there's a little bit of evidence, very weak, that it can reduce the risk of death from all causes. It was one of the herbs traditionally used to improve longevity, but there's no epidemiological or clinical trial data to show it. There is only historical 
anecdotal data to suggest that it might. We have no data on lemon balm and heart attack or stroke. However, there's a little bit of data about it does have antiviral activity, mainly outside the laboratory. And again, it does have some specific activity against some types of cancer cell, mainly in the laboratory. So there's some weak evidence for that. And then the last herb I mentioned, oat straw, the only thing it has a little bit of weak evidence for in this initial category is heart attack and stroke. And that is whole oat that you eat, they're just, you know, porridge oats, they do seem to reduce cholesterol, which reduces the risk of heart attack and stroke. So second category is the mechanisms. And I've listed five, which I mentioned earlier in this video. Inflammation for lemon balm, the second herb, nothing specifically for inflammation. It's pretty strong antioxidant. There's one trial which is really interesting which showed that Melissa lemon balm tea was able to reverse or prevent damage to the DNA resulting from occupational radiation exposure. So that's really interesting for anybody who is a radiographer or who works in aviation, who works as an air hostess or whatever, because you're exposed to atmospheric radiation or radiation from the medical equipment. Lemon balm was able to reverse that cellular damage. So it's a pretty powerful antioxidant. Uh, it, it also improves peripheral circulation a little bit and it's anti-anxiety. It will lower cortisol a bit. I don't think we have any direct evidence of it lowering cortisol, but there's plenty of evidence to show that it's anti-anxiety that it will, will reduce adrenaline. And then the last herb in this category, oats have weak evidence for all of those, all pretty weak, all in the laboratory. When I say oats here, I'm talking about the green oats, the actual green grassy bit with its, we often call it in herbal medicine, milky oats. The bits that are used medicinally of the oats are the whole upper part of the plant with the seeds while the seeds are milky. So they aren't fully ripe. It hasn't dried out. It's not ready to be harvested as a, as a grain. It's a green milky plant and we tincture the fresh plant. We make an alcohol extract of the fresh plant and that's really what I'm talking about here. Porridge oats may have some effects here, but you really need the fresh plant uh, for these effects. And then the last category is psychological or mental health. For lemon balm, we know it's an anti-anxiety herb. It's quite effective for that. So I've given it a couple of stars for loneliness, mood and anxiety. We don't know if it affects fear responses. And there's some moderate, slightly stronger evidence for its ability to help improve sleep pattern. And for oat straw, again, I've just given it one, one star for each. So to go over some of the specific research, for cacao and chocolate, like I say, I'm going to be doing a whole other one hour long presentation on that. So do look out for that when it comes out. It'll go into all the details and the mechanisms and whatever. For lemon balm, we've got some rat studies <laughs> in vivo and rats showing that lemon balm improved memory and learning in these rats and was able to undo some of the amnesia causing effects of a, of a drug called scopolamine, which is used to induce learning deficits. And it was able to do so at quite low doses. And this is a theme with lemon balm. What's wonderful about this plant, which is in the lavender mint family, it's really easy to grow. It smells amazing. It propagates itself. If you grow it in your garden, if you have a garden, it'll grow everywhere. It's easy to grow in a window box, on a window ledge, indoors. It's a very easy plant to propagate and grow and all you need to do to use it is to uh, get the fresh plant and stick it in a teapot and pour on boiling water and drink it as a tea or get the fresh plant and freeze it and then you can use that as a tea whenever you want through the year or you can get the fresh plant and stick it in a jar and pour on some very high alcohol vodka or grappa some distilled spirit brandy might also work but best if it's very distilled so vodka or grappa and the higher alcohol the better you just pack the jar with fresh lemon balm leaves you pour on the alcohol so it just covers it leave it to steep for a couple of weeks give it a little shake every day and then squeeze it all out and that's a lemon balm tincture and the dose you'd use fresh herb for a cup of tea just a, a, a good little handful of, of fresh leaves to make one cup of tea the tincture once you've made this tincture about a teaspoon in a little glass of water uh, will do you can dry the herb but the dried herb loses a lot 
in both flavor and effect. A lot of the essential oils do volatilize, do escape and transform and oxidize and it loses both antioxidant power and it loses some of its amazing scent when you dry it. So I would certainly suggest using this plant fresh. In humans, a single acute dose of 600 milligrams, that's like nibbling on a leaf, that's literally just like eating one little leaf of lemon balm, was found to improve cognitive performance in standard tests. And in another trial, this was a 16 week clinical trial, just using 60 drops a day of a standardized tincture, which would be roughly equivalent to a, a teaspoon of the crude tincture I've described already. We just stuff it in a jam jar, pour on vodka, leave it for a couple of weeks, strain it out, teaspoon of that in some water, about the same. 16 week clinical trial of 42 people with Alzheimer's disease, mild to moderate Alzheimer's disease. The lemon balm extract reduced agitation, improved cognitive function and behavioral function as well. So there were noticeable objective improvements in their condition. And then an ethanolic extract, that's an alcohol extract equivalent to the tincture again in animal trials, was found to reduce ventricular premature beats in the heart. And this relates to what I was talking about in a previous video about social isolation reducing high frequency heart rate variability. So lemon balm can actually normalize the heart rate. Um, a little bit. It's used, one of its traditional uses is for palpitations. So in these animals, it reduced tach palpitations essentially, and it was able to reduce arrhythmias. And in humans, in a human trial, it reduced the frequency of palpitations in humans with benign palpitations. So this is really interesting because we have a herb that's anti-anxiety that improves cognition and that can actually restore normal sort of tone to the heart, if you like, which is overstimulated by adrenaline. And a water extract in rats was found to increase endothelial nitric oxide formation. What that means, nitric oxide is a, a chemical produced in the linings of blood vessels and other places, which dilates the blood vessels. So the lemon balm, just the water extract taken orally was able to, in these rats at least, increase the production of nitric oxide in the lining of blood vessels and therefore improve their peripheral circulation, which we know from the previous videos is one of the things that is impacted by chronic stress and by social isolation in particular. And it also had a concentration dependent vasorelaxant activity in the aorta, meaning the more of this water extract they were given, the more the major artery coming out of the heart was relaxed and the more the blood flow through that improved. And a lower dose of just 50 milligrams per kilogram body weight, which is quite equivalent to a normal medicinal dose for a human, increased heart resistance to cardiac injury. In other words, when the heart was subjected to chemical or physical injury, the rats being pre-dosed with lemon balm, that the heart was more resistant to damage. There was also in the lab mild inhibition of several cancer cell lines. There were anti-nociceptive, meaning pain-reducing effects in several models of diabetic hyperalgesia. So that's people with diabetes, poor blood sugar control tend to get more susceptibility to pain and lemon balm offset that. It also lowered blood sugar a little bit, lowered blood fats a little bit, had strong antioxidant effects and antimicrobial effects. So that's lemon balm, pretty useful. And then oats, the last herb. The interesting thing about oats is they contain these triterpenoids, these compounds that sort of have a steroidy structure and may interact with steroid receptors, such as those you find on the hypothalamus that control the body's steroid systems, including the stress steroids, the cortisol system. Maybe, don't know, hypothetical. But it has been found that an extract of the green oats, and by the way, to, you can buy these, these extracts, but you can make them by growing the plant and then again getting the fresh plant, lots of the fresh plant, really packing it into a jar and pouring on very high alcohol grappa or vodka, ideally grappa, something with an alcohol content of 60% or more. But if you can get vodka, which is only 39%, 40%, that will kind of, do, that'll do, it'll do. There's a lot of water in the plant, so it'll, it'll end up with a lower alcohol content, so it won't preserve quite as well, but it'll do. So all you do is just pack a jam jar with the fresh oats, the, the, the grass and the little seeds, the fresh seeds, and you pour on this alcohol, leave it for a couple of weeks, shake it every day, and then strain it out. And that be a, 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 an oats tincture, but you can get oats tinctures as well. And that works, oats, or ordinary porridge oats, as I've said, will have some effect, 
but they, they aren't going to be as effective as the fresh oats tincture. The oats extract inhibited a brain chemical called monoamine oxidase B, which is an enzyme that breaks down monoamines like serotonin. So by inhibiting that, you're increasing the levels potentially of happy chemicals in the brain. And also another chemical called phosphodiesterase 4, which breaks down a substance called cyclic AMP. And these inhibitors of PDE4, phosphodiesterase 4, do several things, including they help wakefulness, they protect nerve cells, they're anti-inflammatory, they are antidepressant, and they improve cognitive function usually. So have there been any trials? Well, yes, there have a couple of very small trials. The green oats extract in rats caused the rats to respond more beneficially to stresses, improved their ability to learn things under stressful conditions, and enhanced pro-social behavior in the rats. In humans, there wasn't such an obvious effect, but they did find that a single dose of green oats increased brain function on EEG, that's an electroencephalograph, a scan of the brain function, uh, with a change in the frontal cortex, that's the thinky bit activity, and that a medium-sized dose was shown to improve cognitive performance of elderly subjects with cognitive impairment. So there was some measurable improvement in their ability to think. In middle-aged subjects with multiple, there were multiple cognitive benefits, including speed of processing, executive function, and word recall. So that's pretty interesting. Those were single doses in healthy subjects. And then a 1,500 milligram extract was shown to increase peripheral and cerebral vasodilation. That is blood flow to the peripheries and to the brain, which as I talked about in my video on social isolation, that you know the, the increased level of background adrenaline will tend to impair. So any substance that helps to reverse that is good. And then in Another trial uh, with 35 to 60 year old people, they found that the higher dose of 900 milligrams every day for 29 days improved accuracy and tracking in cognition, uh, had no effect in mood in these humans over 29 days. These were not depressed humans. These were happy people, ordinary people, but there was a measurable effect on stress in that it, it affected their galvanic skin response to stress. In other words, the ordinary sort of electrical responses of the skin were changed. What that means longer term, who knows, may mean nothing. But from those trials in humans, it's at least we have preliminary evidence to show that the green oats extract does seem to improve some measures of cognition. It does at least change some way, in some way, the way the body handles stress. And from the pharmacological information, it, it's likely to be somewhat protective to nerve cells and anti-inflammatory and antidepressant and all the rest of it. And traditionally, oats extract was used for palpitations, anxiety, and to help recovery after illness and to, to reduce nervousness, etc. The reason I've recommended these three plants particularly is that they are all food grade. They are all extremely high well, I won't say harmless because there'll be someone out there who's allergic to chocolate, there'll be someone out there who's allergic to lemon balm, and there'll be someone out there who's allergic to oats, I guarantee it. But the point is, for most of us, they are very harmless and they are accessible. Oats, at the very least, you can eat porridge. There's a very old trial showing that people who eat porridge every day had 5% increase in stamina. So even porridge will give you some of those benefits. But the green oats you could grow and tincture, the lemon balm you could grow and tincture, you could get these, uh, the oats as an oat straw tincture, you can buy the lemon balm as a tincture or as a dried herb, and of course you can buy dark chocolate from any supermarket. Although ideally I'd suggest you get pure cacao, the, the, the actual blocks of chocolate without any extra fat or sugar and make drinks out of them. I'll go into that a bit more in my, in my longer video on the subject. And of course, you can always buy my book, which tells you all about it and more. Um, anyway, this has been a very long video, the longest in the series so far. Um, I've been trying to keep all the recent videos to 10 minutes just because I've noticed that the average watch time is around five. Hopefully, some of you have managed to make it to the end. Thank you if you have. If you did find this video 
informative and useful, then please do like it, please do share it, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed, and hopefully I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye.